So you, you did something interesting, which is you kind of bootstrapped. Started with a service, moved to software. Those of you who came to see Brian Johnson of Braintree, another one of the great Chicago uh, startups, heard his story of doing that. In fact, I, say, I always say Chuck Templeton is the Kevin Bacon of the Chicago startup community because he uh, not only found an open table, but he helped. He's the chairman of Grubhub, and he gave Brian Johnson his move into software. You made a similar move from service to software. Talk about that as a model and, and how that worked and, and how you made it work. So it's so funny because the prevailing wisdom today, well actually, no, I think it's changing. But every VC and private equity company will tell you, you know, we don't like service businesses. We got to build software. Everything's got to be software based. And I think people are changing their tune today, that they're realizing that a technology, technology enabled service company, you know, or a managed services company with strong technology, however you want to look at it or define it, can create great value. So for me, it was selling, creating the revenue that allowed me to build this software um, that also allowed me to go from bootstrapping it for the first few years. I picked a $1.8 million in angel capital in 2005 to 2006. I gave up about 10% of the company for that. And then we didn't pick up another round of capital in the end of 2010. We picked up $22.5 million as a Series A. Um, and uh, gave up a, a relatively low percentage of the company in order to receive that. So, so talk about that funding experience for me, because you go, you've scaled. So I mean, I, I've, you know, I've talked about your growth, and it's unbelievable. But but talk a little bit about your growth. When you decided to take money, why you decided to take money, what was uh, because you didn't you didn't were in a position where you had to take money. Right. Yeah. So uh, with regards to our Series A, which is kind of funny when you walk in as a Series A and ask for twenty-five million dollars, <laughs> they're like, "This is the largest Series A we've ever, you know, seen ask for." So we didn't have to take money. I'll put that out there. Uh, but I just come off of two thousand eight and two thousand nine, and there were three things. One, I never wanted to go through recession again ever without money in the bank. That was like probably the largest driver. Number two. My angel investors have been in for five years. I felt it was the, the right thing to do is to, re, to return liquidity to them. So all my angels got all their money back, some with a really nice return, and they still let two-thirds of their investment ride. And then the third was, um, and I guess I, I'm, I'm kind of partial to the third, but it was an opportunity for me to create some small liquidity in my life um, after the hard work that I've been run. doing. I mean, yeah. it's John Ayello is the founder of Sabo, who I'll have here at some point, who's a great guy. Um, he's built a great... B2B SaaS company, um, you know, probably, I think it's, it, uh, he wrote it for 10 years, got it to probably 150 million the value, and the next level is probably four or 500, brought in an outside CEO, and he said, you know, I'm just tired. Yeah. And the ability to take, to get the money to help the company grow, the ability to be able to take a little money for his family, I mean, you know, these, um, if you look at almost all our founders, with the exception of Siri, almost all of our founders, I mean, you know, Matt and Mike from Grubhub started in 2004. You started in 2001, um, you know, Brian started in 2003 or 2005, something like I mean, people have been doing this a long time and, you know, there's this tendency to think everything's Instagram. <laughs> no, I mean, you got, I mean, Go Health was, Go Health and uh, Kay Kira both started the same year I did. You know, huh. Brandon and Andrew, like, so there's a lot of companies that we've all in it over a decade now. Yeah, and I think that's, away. I think that's, you know, I, having done that, I know how hard that is. And I think the uh, ability to get liquidity is really important. I want to go back to a couple of questions. There's one here that dovetails with mine, but this person has more homework than I have. Oh, um, it was about vision, sort of what this can be. And uh, you said in 2007 you had not yet fulfilled your vision. What does that vision look like today? Yeah. Uh, it's, so the vision to me was start a service company, perfect the software, spin the software out. That was the vision. Now, because um, we've got a lot of technology and, and folks here and, and developers here, I'm just going to explain what happens with our technology because I think it's an interesting piece of our story. So we hired a development team in 2006, and we, and we were doing Rails, open source, agile. And you know that was all new. It was a relatively new uh, language at the time. And so we built this amazing platform, an amazing platform that does a lot of everything you needed to do, it does. Well, five years later, we end up with one big freaking platform. You know, my, you know, I, 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 in my term, it's one big ball of code. It was not built as intelligently as we should have built it. It wasn't built in a modular um, way. It wasn't something we could scale. We had way too much uh, uh, debt from a, a code perspective that we would code have to debt, clean up. Code debt is inevitable, but it's hard. It's yeah. And so uh, 
so the team, uh, the development team, came to me back in you know two years ago, sort of been you know in, in early '11, and said, "Hey, because um, I was like, guys, we've got the platform done. Let's go." And they said, "Sean, we can do it, but we're going to go slow." I said, "Or we want 18 months to redevelop the software in a modular um, uh, modular components, sharing no code with the old platform." And if you allow us to do that, it means take a break and do nothing from a new development standpoint. That's hard because people want features. Yeah. And well, the good news is we were the only ones using our software back then. So we didn't have software customers, we were, but we were ready to move that direction. So what happened is, um, you know, I said it was the right thing to do. We incurred risk of going underwater for 18 months and not putting anything out. But Well, and, and having yeah. done that, I could say not everything comes in on schedule. So if it... Yeah. Sometimes building software is like building, when these people say they built the house, they said it took twice as long, cost twice as much. That's yeah. a real risk because you don't know right. going out, can you really hit 18 months? Yeah, that's right. And so the vision was, the service business was always wonderful, and it is wonderful, and I think our service business is gonna go is gonna continue to grow. I expect that we're gonna go global with that. So I expect that's got a really huge and amazing life out of it. But if you look at a market share perspective, we'll never on a service basis touch more than probably 20% of the impressions in the industry from a, on a display level. And my goal is to automate everything. I, wanted, I want our software and services to touch 100% of the entire industry, be the platform. And so um, the vision was we had to get that software to market. And, and you know, for uh, Exit to go public, you know, software, as we know, drives a much higher multiple uh, than service revenue. Absolutely. And so that's, uh, that's kind of the path we're looking at. That's great. So. I um, want to go with a couple more questions from people here. Uh, one was the number one vote getter right now is do you have any other business ventures outside of Central? Um, I'm investing a lot on an, angel, on, on an angel side, so I've done quite a bit of that. What are you excited about? What am I excited about? Um, I'm probably most excited about Scholastica Great. right now. Rob's actually sitting here in the audience with me too, so sorry, spotlight on him. Um, That's good. I look forward to hearing. We love so there's stories. Scholastica. I love what they're doing. They're uh, really redefining uh, the journal, um, academic journal space, hmm. which is wonderful. Uh, love uh, Utopia. These guys are really creating uh, incentive, kind of doing doing well by doing good awards for education and in the school system. So I love both of those companies. Um, or were, there was something else. That were, uh, um, no, I think you covered the ones that I had. I think they're. It's interesting. You know, it's hard. Uh, when you run the company to be an angel, but it's oh. such a big benefit. <clears throat> Sorry, this is, this is an interesting piece of it. Yeah. And I'll just be very candid with everyone. My goal was to start a company by the 30 and exit by the time I was 42. Um, I'm 40 years old. <laughs> uh, I told them we were at an event and I said, so now you turned 40, he said, how did you know that? I said, your, your date of birth is in the YPO directory. <laughs> <laughs> and like, so... And this is an interesting piece to it, and because, you know, my plan is to keep us going. Um, you know, whatever, you know, I'll always do what's best for our shareholders and, and investors and all that. So if someone comes along and wants us to write a big check, that's fine. Um, but at the same point, I think we are unique. I think we've got a strong roadmap. I would as much love to take Centro public and let Centro be a public tech anchor for the city of Chicago. That's a, that would be a wonderful thing for us to do because I think we, we could Chicago. attract talent. Versus, you know, if we bought it, it could dissipate. My goal is to, that would be a great thing in my life. But if I do that, I'm signing up for a little bit longer than I was really hoping for. And I'm okay with that. But 42 is kind of a random number when you get down to it. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. I don't well, know maybe there was a plan. I don't know. Well, I've, had, I've got every year planned out for, until I'm like 70 years old. <laughs> That's any of this. But so here's this. I had to change my plan. And here's the difference in changing the plan is that Centro is a wetsuit that I've wore for 12 years. Hmm. Uh, there is no separation between me and Centro. Mm -hmm. And this year I came in and I said, I've got to, I've got to create separation in my life. So um, one, um, I've been co-writing a uh, film for the last two years. And so cool. moving a movie into production this year. Uh, so that's an exciting, different yeah. business venture of my own. That's cool. Complete, I'm learning. I'm learning something brand new. And then the other thing is I'm going back and getting my master's in public policy. And I'm just trying to get a life outside of Centro um, taking place. I totally understand that. My wife will say to me, I'll be driving in the car and say, what you, where are you? What are you thinking about? And, you know, I'm thinking about something, about the business, something exciting, you know, or something challenging. Right. 
sometimes it's exciting, sometimes it's a little nerve wracking, but it is, you know, you can't, you can't leave it aside. It's hard. It's great. To do have you find it school. being, do you find it, you know, and you've got what, two kids? Three. Three kids, right? So three. My second came in pair. I got twins. So. Being, oh, oh the, the, there we go. Yeah. Easy. Check. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, how does that affect, I mean, being an entrepreneur, there's probably great benefits to it, but there's probably great negatives to so it. So I just took being over married. the second company I started called Max, which is an advertising business, which is growing really well. I mean, first look grew. We got the award for, for, being, for being the fourth fastest growing software company in 08. And, but we was like blood, sweat, and tears to get there. I mean, it was, we did it the hard way, headwinds, chop and all. You know, Max is growing much faster because you learn, right? You get better at these things. You figure out the things you did wrong. You keep doing the things you did right. And the thing I'll say is, so I just sort of uh, really took the reins fully back over recently. And, you know, it's, you're all in. Like, there's no halfway. And so it's exciting. We have an office in Austin. I'm down with those people. They're really excited. People in Austin are great. They're like Chicago people, but there's a huge amount of tech talent there. They want to build companies. They're really great. But you're all in. Like, you're just, you have to be all in. And I'm excited about it. But it is hard. Like, it's hard to go from that to Little Jim and be focused on my kids. All I do is somersaults. And you got to be all in for your kid. I mean, you know, that's their whole world revolves around you doing that. And so I'm lucky and I have those two things, but it keeps me from... You know, basically, I learned this from my dad, who's a very successful entrepreneur, as you know. And, you know, his thing was, he's like, I'm building my company, and I'm about my family. Once you have kids, it's like you have to make that. I think you have to make that trade-off because you can't do, there's no room for three. Right. And through three things. And I think that's been a big, a big piece. And now I travel with my, you know, I travel, but I try and reduce my travel. So I've got to go to Florida for the day. I go to L.A. for the day, which, you know, you travel 20 hours, but I'm there when they wake up the next morning. Um, now I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how long you can do twenty-hour <laughs> trips, but it does. You know, the, the nature of tech is you're all in, and I do think there's something about John Ayello, who's on my board of founders, Savo, is taking a sabbatical. Almost. He's on the board of the company he founded, and in some ways, I envy him for the rejuvenation of it because there's no way to not be obsessive about something you founded, you care about, you're passionate about, um, and when you're all in, it's more successful. I mean, I, just having reengaged with the business. I was down in Austin. Our guys are really fired up. Our guys here are really fired up. There's exciting things we can do. And as the founder, you know, you can motivate them and get them excited and, 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 and see where you can take it in a way other people can't. And so it's almost like you've got to be all in or you've got to go on the sideline. You can't really live in the middle. And I think that's the, that's the challenge. And I think you've done a great job with it. I love the fact that you've shifted your plan because you care about the company. And what a great thing for Chicago to say, you could sell this company, obviously, for a great great deal of money and be incredibly wealthy for the rest of your life tomorrow. But I love the fact that you want to keep it and build it because being a tech anchor in Chicago, we need those. And yes, that's, I, I think it's exciting. 